let's go back to the beginning. What was the best economic policy of the Biden administration? That was answered by True Dill Tom, who's been a very good subscriber and listener to this show. And it's, and again, I apologize for the delays and the technical difficulties, but now that we've got this working, um, let's get this show going on in earnest. Uh, and when there's the archives of this, which I'm going to record, I'm going to just simply cut out the um, original one and make it a video instead of in the live section. So um, the, when it comes to the, the Biden administration's economic policies, uh, the best one is the banning of non-competes. Non-competes have been illegal here in California for a long time. And the banning of non-competes in California has allowed the Silicon Valley tech ecosystem to grow a lot faster than it would have otherwise. Uh, without um, the um, the t without the non-competes, say if you are starting a new improved version of a software at a big technology company, that big technology company can sue you out of existence and um, make you pay back a bunch of penalties for starting a company that competes. These are common more in the finance industry and um, other non-technology companies that have IP. However, I've seen non-competes as stupid as, say, like a fast food restaurant banning workers because they have a secret recipe or something trivial such as that or that's hard to prove and all non-competes do is they keep wages down they deprive opportunities from ambitious professionals to either switch jobs or start businesses and neither of those are good things so um, by changing that standard that applied to like california as a nationwide um, solution what i think would be a much better um, for the economy in the long run. And I think it's by far the best thing the Biden administration has done in terms of economics. And let's now look at our next question, which is the opposite. And listeners, if you have a question or watching this stream, feel free to put it in the chat. I'll answer any questions in the live stream, but I'm going to prioritize first the people who asked in advance because they have, um, given me more time to prepare with more thoughtful answers to their questions. So question number two, what were the worst economic policies enacted by the Trump administration? Yeah, I mean, as long, um, even though Trump has been perceived as the great president for the economy and his tax reform was good for the economy and a lot of other policies and deregulation as well, there were some bad economic policies. Uh, I think the stimulus checks in the long run are going to be regarded as a bad economic policy, but I think really the worst is not a single policy, but a precedent that is set. And the precedent that is set by the Trump administration is they basically killed the fiscal conservative wing of the Republican Party and has made a lot of people otherwise would be their base become politically homeless because there really is no room for fiscal conservatism in American politics. Um, there are no serious right-wing politicians now who actually want to reform Social Security, get rid of Medicare, or cut defense spending. And they may be anti-tax, but if you're anti-tax without cutting any spending, you're even more fiscally liberal than the tax and spend Democrats are. And I think in the long run, this is going to cause a lot of problems with the economy because there's really nobody who wants to do anything to stop spending. And you're going to have bigger and bigger fiscal deficits, which are not going to necessarily result in the U.S. defaulting on the debt that will be paid through money printing, but will result in structurally higher inflation than there should be, especially given the context of um, the def otherwise deflationary forces of technological innovation and less consumption from an aging population. But there's, I think that 
the fiscal force and impulse is going to outweigh all the deflationary benefits of competition in several industries. And so that's why I think maybe inflation won't be as high as in the 70s, but it'll be high enough to be painful for a lot longer than people expect. Like with the Fed cutting rates, people think the inflation problem is over. Um, I'm personally skeptical of that. Even in the short term, the numbers are starting to get more benign. Uh, the next question I have is, what do you think of Nobel laureate Fama's idea that actively managed portfolios are fated to lose to the indices? If you agree, what do you think that means for careers in finance? That's a good question. Um, the first one part of that question is that I think that actively managed portfolios are not fated to lose to indices. If you look at every other index except for U.S. large cap equity, uh, active management outperforms at a much higher rate than what is perceived by the general public. The statistic people use is, oh, the S&P 500 is... Um, oh, it outperforms 85% of active managers. Yeah, the, the thing is they outperform 85% of large cap U.S. stock funds. And the way that other indexes are constructed, such as the Russell 2000, the emerging market indexes, or bond indices, they don't really have the compounding impact where the S&P rewards the companies that are growing faster since it's cap weight and they become a bigger percentage of the cap. And if they keep compounding, that triggers returns. Whereas at the Russell, if a stock does too good on the Russell small cap index, they get promoted into the mid cap index and then maybe even to the S&P 500. And whereas if a company does bad in the S&P, they get kicked down to the mid cap or the small cap. So that's how small cap and mid cap indices may not have the same forces that lead to outperformance. And then with bonds, the companies that have the most um, – Debt issued often are the biggest uh, weights in the index, and the largest debtors may not be the best quality credits. So I think that that's flawed because people just have this like blinders to only focus on S&P 500 or NASDAQ. And in terms of what it means for finance careers, since I don't think this is an issue, I don't think it means anything for finance careers. But if it was... Let's just say every index can outperform every type of asset class and every investor's ideal allocation is just a mix of S&P and the top bond index because nobody can beat those given their level of risk. Then there wouldn't be an investment management industry. Every investment advisor would just be an asset gatherer whose job is just to raise as much assets as possible. So that would be the business. It's just basically the entire buy side would just be a bunch of salespeople because, and compliance to make sure they don't say anything that gets them in trouble because there would really be no other role left. And in terms of um, the other rest of the finance industry, it's, it's not really affected. It'd really just be investment management that gets affected. Okay, next question. Can you analyze the different types of common debt products? Mortgages, credit cards, student loans, bank loans, buy now, pay later, etc. And see how prime and subprime borrowers are doing and how much more they're likely to borrow. With mortgages, uh, there's plenty of people who are willing to get mortgages. Uh, and Given how relatively tight lending standards remain for mortgages, there's not really a risk of people being overextended. Like if you see, I've seen the statistic, it's almost it's up to 40% of the entire housing stock is fully paid off with no mortgage. Um, and the remaining 60%, a lot of them are locked in super low rate mortgages that aren't at really real risk of default. Uh, if rates come down meaningfully, I think mortgage demand is going to go up a lot. And so there's a lot more room for people to take on mortgage debt. Credit cards. Credit cards are at 15-year highs, but they're still way lower than they were before the financial crisis. 
Uh, I think I've showed Fred's chart about this in my recent video I did on the consumer in July. And yeah, do I think the capacity though to get to that level is there? No, because the average disposable income growth is a lot lower than it used to be. And given how high the cost of living is on things that cannot be paid with a credit card, such as rent, uh, there's not as much room for people to lever on credit cards. And I think this current high level of credit cards is likely to lead to a possible consumer crunch. So I think borrowing there is limited. Student loans, um, I also think student loan growth is not going to be that much. It's near record highs, but the problem is that the, the size of the cohort of people going to school is much lower than it was than when I was going to college. Uh, the class of 2013 was the peak in terms of enrollment for university and has been going down since. Part of this due there simply due to the years of lower birth rates, there's not as many 18-year-olds in the country. Uh, also, there's the economics. College has gotten a lot more expensive and outside of a few top universities or certain skilled professions, the calculus of going to college doesn't make sense as much as it used to. Watch the video I did on this called Is It Worth Going to College if you want the full details on that. But I don't see student loan growth really accelerating. And a lot of student loan growth actually is more concentrated on the grad school level because even those who fortunately have parents or scholarships pay for undergrad, they probably don't have that same ability to also pay for years of graduate school. And the relative benefit of graduate school, I think, has dropped faster than the relative benefit of undergrad. And so I think that that's going to also put a limit. Uh, car loans, uh, yeah, car loans, I think, also are going to have, have room to go up. I don't, we're not at a world yet where we could piece, perfectly replace car. I don't really know what the auto debt level is relative to history. I haven't done as much research on this one um, as something else I've said. I think the main disruptor really for lower car level debt is if something like Waymo is able to replace people having to drive themselves, particularly older people. Instead of buying your last few cars 70 plus and you just get a Waymo subscription, you know, there's less people borrowing to buy cars. But also those people are more likely to be able to pay for a car in cash given they have years of savings. So. Yeah, I don't really, I'm not really informed enough about car loans to have an accurate opinion on them. Uh, buy now, pay later. I mean, it's growing. I mean, I, my, at least based on the numbers I've seen from Affirm and Klarna and all that, I don't really know how much room is to grow, to be honest. Um, I think that people who use BNPL um, either have to do it to manage cash flow. Let's just say if you're a business who's like Christmas tree company, you the 11 months out of the year, nobody's going to buy um, Christmas trees, but you s are sell out of all of them from Thanksgiving to December 23rd. Uh, that Somebody like that may have need to use something like BNPL to help with cash flow management um, for their personal expenses while times are lean in October or November. That's, I'm trying to give the steel man argument for BNPL because I generally i am a critic of BNPL. I don't really like the idea of people like can't afford to just straight up pay for things, just to say, not save and just spend now. I think it's gonna help increase the people's spending unsustainably. However, if the interest rates are lower than credit cards for BNPL, it actually might be a net better for society and delever things. But I mean, I think that varies depending on location of whether BNPL rates are lower than credit cards and whether they seem to be now based on what I've read about this. But if the industry matures and they prioritize profitability over gaining market share, Will those costs go up to be in line or higher than just simply using a credit card to pay for these things you used buy now, pay later for? Uh, hopefully that answers your question. Um, the next question we have is,
can you evaluate the impact of macroeconomic indicators on stock market trends? Well, they're not perfectly correlated, and I don't really go into specific stock trading advice on this channel just due to compliance issues, given the fact I work in the investment management industry. So I'm not really going to go into specifically how to incorporate this data into investment decisions, but thank you for asking. Uh, the next question is, what is the future of college debt and costs? Will college become less popular? Will colleges have to cut unnecessary admin costs to bring their costs down, such as firing unnecessary admin staff? Well, the answer really to that question is, I think that college debt will go down simply just because of the enrollment cliff. College costs will go down because there's less demand for college and the supply of universities is remaining the same or increasing. However, I think a lot of smaller private universities, you're already starting to see them shut their doors. And I think you'll see for second tier universities, even second tier state universities, may get consolidated or dropped simply just because there's less students going to college. Um, college is already getting less popular. Uh, however, I think if college costs come down significantly, I think there'll be a new equilibrium and college's popularity will come back because even the value of education is still going to be there. Uh, there's also the idea of prospects of online college could also be the way that people do it. And for those who can afford it, we'll go to more traditional college to get the social experiences and the other benefits of going to in-person college. Like going to college, the main benefit for me personally was that I got to kind of try a bunch of different activities and different types of coursework to really figure out what I wanted to do in my post-college career. Like I didn't really realize the business model of the investment management industry or that I could get paid to do what I do now before I went to college. Like I had a very naive, blind view of the business world before, and my time in university helped me kind of figure out what the things I can actually do uh, professionally. And I think that, and also I've met a lot of lifelong friends from college. I tried a lot of new hobbies that I couldn't otherwise, such as fencing, that they're just not gonna have on something impractical like that and most things beyond a, outside of a major college campus. So, and also the chance of having like a hybrid transition between being fully dependent on your parents and living at home to being a fully independent adult with their own income. College kind of provides like moving away from college, like a transition stage. I guess boarding high school could do the same thing in theory, but there's still, I think a lot of benef social benefits and life experience benefits that are gonna have people still go to college. And yeah, will they fire up necessary admin staff? course they're going to fire unnecessary admin staff eventually i think that'll happen first in the private universities and later in the state system or really they simply let the current admin staff retire and just don't hire new ones instead of mass firings that's usually how government attrition for labor works is not really through firing but just simply not replacing the retirees uh yeah those are all the questions that were asked in advance. Uh, and if you would like me to ask answer anything else, um, feel free to leave a comment now. Uh, in terms of the future of this channel, I first of all, I'd like to thank all the 2,500 subscribers that we have so far. Uh, it's been a great experience doing this channel. I've had several meetups across the country and even the world. So I've seen some of you guys in person and the community developing has been good. Uh, this channel's also helped like increase play an avenue for my intellectual curiosity and as well as educating the, the public about a lot of things in the world of finance and macroeconomics, which I feel are not being discussed or being discussed with a bias um, one way or the other that kind of clouds the message that is being delivered. And I have my own biases as well, so 
but I feel like I like bringing my own unique perspective, particularly as a investment professional. Uh, I eventually want to do a conference. I need to, I've been, I wanted to hopefully do it this year, but I don't think the audience on this channel is big enough to sell out a conference and me get the venue and the infrastructure and all that for it yet. But that's something I, I, I plan on doing in the future as this channel grows. And I'm probably on bringing more guests content, um, such as um, Damon Cassidy, who I brought on for a few videos in um, July and August. And I'll have to be a guest on some other YouTube channels as well. And I want to do just more deeper dives into things. And that's a variety of different topics. And I might come back to some of the old ones, such as old money, um, and the economic futures. And the question I'd like to ask, really, I might put this in a poll too, is do you guys want me to wait on doing economic futures until I visit the countries mentioned, like I did with Sweden or Denmark? Or should I keep doing them anyway, even if I don't have any travel plans to go to that part of the world anytime soon? And that kind of, I think, is going to wrap this up Unless if uh, the audience has any additional questions. And for those who are watching this stream, thanks for watching. I think I might do the next one until we're at like five or 10,000 subscribers. And uh, if you think that this is not a good time of the day to do it, I might try to change it to a different time of the day. It's right before Labor Day weekend. So a lot of people are going on vacation and enjoying the last minutes of their summer. But yeah, that's a wrap. And again, thank you for everybody for dealing with the technical difficulties. And uh, hopefully I'll do more of these in the future if you like them. Thanks for watching.